shall we fear when the Lord is the Lord of our lives? Rejoice, church, for this is the day the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, and welcome to worship here at Triune Mercy Center. We are delighted you're here in person or joining us online today. We say welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I have several announcements this morning, the first of which is this art piece today, a watercolor by Fred Wood, entitled Starting a New Canvas, featuring our own hillbilly sitting at the canvas. But what a great way to think about life, life when we follow Christ. We start at a new canvas every day. And so I thank God for the gift of Fred um, and sharing that artwork today with us. Um, in your bulletin, you'll notice there are several announcements. The first one is to please silence your cell phone during the service. Also today, we are, I'm very excited, we are going to be having lunch for whoever wants to come and fellowship. We're going to be doing it in groups of 8 to 10 people. If you did not bring a lunch, we have plenty. Do not feel guilty, we have lunch. But if you brought your lunch, please join us. Everybody will head out these doors and um, go up the stairs to the second floor. We have staff that will tell you where to go. And if we fill up the second floor, thanks be to God, we'll go to the third floor. But we'll be in air conditioning and um, you can grab a water on your way up and lunch as well if you did not bring it. But please don't let lunch deter you from coming for God has provided and we shall partake, amen? So everyone is invited for some fellowship after worship today. Next week, we're going to begin collecting information. We have a database here, um, but we don't have a lot of people's information for the pastors or for the staff. So we're going to ask if you would feel comfortable giving us your name and your mailing address and your cell number, your email address, you choose. We're going to have you put it on an index card beginning next week, and that is only going to be for the staff use. So we just need to know if you're in the hospital, how we get in touch with you, or if anything goes on like that. So we're just collecting that information for staff use only. Beginning next week, there will be cards, index cards, for you to fill out your information and then put it in the offering pouch. But I will be here to remind you about that next week. Today we welcome um, a friend and colleague, the Reverend Eric Beber, who is gonna be preaching this morning. Eric is an advocate for affordable housing. He's working currently with Beacon Properties in Spartanburg. Um, but Eric also has a lovely family. Um, they're sitting over here, I won't embarrass them, but um, Lizzie, Reverend Lizzie Beber is the executive director at United Ministries here in town. And also they have two wonderful children, Eli and Annette. So I hope that you will welcome them this morning. as we look forward to hearing a word from God from Eric. Last but not least, I thank everybody who made worship possible this morning for our guest musicians and for our current stayed wonderful musicians. We thank you for sound and live stream and ushers and readers and for the staff. So without further ado, let us turn our hearts and souls and minds over to the worship of our living God. I would like to invite Mr. Alton Gatewood to read our responsive reading. Good morning, church. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Happy are those who help is from God. And the, the one who made heaven and earth, the one who created the sea and all that is in them.
God will regain forever for all generations. Praise the Lord. long to encounter God, to experience God in our daily lives, yet often God surprises us. 
showing up in people and places we don't expect. Let us now come before God, confessing the ways we tend to overlook God in our midst, praying together the prayer found in your bulletins. Merciful God, you know how we love miracles. We love your healing, life-giving presence. We confess that poverty and oppression are less appealing topics. Forgive us. Most times we find you among the poor, the downtrodden, the widow, and the orphan. In their midst, we also find your prophets and miracles. Dwell with us as we make the struggles of our, our own struggles. Equip us to speak against injustice and to be fed and clothe those who need. Grant us your compassion. May we truly be your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Sorry. God seeks the lost and extends the invitation again and again. God welcomes us when we turn back to God. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, choir, and thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, church, for inviting me to share with you what God has laid on my heart today. Uh, as we turn now toward our written word, hear a reading from the prophet Jeremiah. The Lord proclaims, go down to the palace of the king of Judah and declare this message. Listen to the words, the Lord's word, king of Judah, you who sit on David's throne, you and your descendants and all those who go through these gates. The Lord proclaims, do what is just and right. Rescue the oppressed from the power of the oppressor. Don't exploit or mistreat the refugee, the orphan, and the widow. Don't spill the blood of the innocent in this place. If you obey this command, then through the gates of this palace will come kings who occupy the throne of David, riding on chariots and horses, along with their entourage and subjects. But if you ignore these words, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that this palace will become ruin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together in this place be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I've been listening in online and last week in person to the summer sermon, summer sermon series on the prophet Jeremiah here at Triune. If you'll remember, a couple of weeks ago, Jennifer invited us to hear and learn about Jeremiah's call to both love God's people unconditionally and to be brave enough to call royalty to repentance. Last week, she invited us to reflect on the potter who refuses to throw away her art, but instead reworks the same lump of clay over and over again, even though it keeps getting off balance on the wheel. Jeremiah was a remarkable priest and prophet whose job description included giving pastoral care to the brokenhearted as well as bravely risking his life in order to speak truth to power. His ministry began with a very hopeful gaze upon Israel, but over the course of his 40 years of prophesying, he witnessed a stubborn nation dig in its hills, heels in the face of uncertainty. He saw two invasions by Babylon, the second culminating in the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, and he ultimately stuck by his people as they were carried off into exile in Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq, where the people lived as second-class citizens for nearly 70 years. It was a turbulent time for Israel, and consequently a turbulent profession if you were a prophet. With Israel being on the Mediterranean, open to attack by sea, and being situated at the crux between the Roman Empire the continent of Africa, the heart of Asia, one can easily imagine how many wars it might have found itself fighting with, without always knowing why. The context of today's passage is prior to the destruction of the temple, prior to the people of Israel being carried off into exile in Babylon. But, as you may have gathered from the reading of today's scripture, the pressure is building. The Lord, Yahweh, instructs Jeremiah to go down to the throne of the southern kingdom, Judah, and give the king a message. Listen to the Lord's word, king of Judah, you who sit on David's throne, you and your attendants and all those who go through these gates. Don't you love how he addresses and names everyone? Listen, this just isn't for the king. It's not just for the advisors. This is for all y'all. You know, and it's kind of southern speak. You know, there's you, which could be plural. There's y'all, which is a group of y'all. Then there's all y'all, right? <laughs> what Jeremiah says, listen, all y'all, okay? So we'll use all y'all. That'll do just fine for us today. And then comes the message right up front. Jeremiah doesn't beat around the bush. No disclaimers, just straight truth. The Lord proclaims, do what is just and right. Righteousness, rightness, justice, fairness, equality, equity, not sameness, but oneness. 
utter mutuality, making right the things in life that somehow, whether you played the lead role or you were part of the supporting cast or you just showed up at the box office, the things that somewhere along the way went horribly wrong, making those right. And perhaps those words weren't specific enough for the king. And God uses Jeremiah as a mouthpiece to spell out some of those specifics for him. Rescue the oppressed from the power of the oppressor. Don't exploit or mistreat the refugee, the orphan, and the widow. Don't spill the blood of the innocent in this place, Jeremiah says. Perhaps you've heard some of those terms before, like widows and orphans. If it sounds like a familiar phrase to you, maybe it's because it occurs over 40 times in the Bible. Add that to all the mentions of refugees and immigrants and strangers, and we're talking over 200 times in the Bible that the reader's attention is turned towards the needs of the, quote, refugee, the orphan, and the widow, to use Jeremiah's words. Translation, the most vulnerable matter to the heart of God, a lot. Jeremiah Really, all the biblical writers lived in a time and place where family and tribal loyalties were central to pretty much every aspect of life. No one was an island. Life was lived leaning on one another for food and support and care and protection. One body, but many parts. Everyone was needed and everyone was valued. This was the, not just y'all, but all y'all of ancient Israel. If a woman's husband died and she became a widow, or if a family was driven from their homeland because of war and they became refugees, or if children had lost their parents and became orphans, a link in the chain of interconnectedness was broken and they became vulnerable. Life was just too hard, it was too callous, it was too lonely to be lived separated from community, or is. Not was, perhaps. With all the pressures surrounding the kingdom of Israel and Judah during this time, pressure from warships from the Mediterranean, pressure from the Roman Empire to the Northwest, pressure from the Egyptians who had previously enslaved them from the South, pressure from the Babylonians from the East, with the nation of Israel feeling like they were the bone that the three hungry dogs are fighting over. Jeremiah's words must sound crazy to this king. Can't you hear him now? With all I have going on, trying to defend us against this army and fight off that navy and making sure those chariots don't rush in the back door through the desert, I don't have time to worry about widows and orphans and refugees. We're going to end up refugees ourselves. But that's the irony of the whole thing, though. I don't think we're too unlike that king oftentimes. When the pressure's building in and pushing in on us from all sides, we flex our muscles and we either beat it back until it goes away or we ignore it and pretend that we're tough enough to not let it, let it bother us. And it seems to work enough times that we come to believe that with enough strength and enough willpower and hope and might, if we can just imagine that it'll be gone, it shall be done, and God will protect us at all costs. But that's not the pattern of reality that I hear in Jeremiah's mass message. It's not the pattern of reality that we see all throughout the Bible, and it's not the pattern of reality of the life of Jesus. It's not the pattern of reality made manifest in the 12-step program either. You see, from 2010 to 2020, my family had the great pr privilege of living alongside a group of men on the addiction recovery journey, journey in our nation's capital at a nonprofit called Christ House. And I learned very quickly that when you live in a recovery community and you can't escape being shown love by people in a context like that, you can't help but to allow some of their truth to rub off, rub off on you. One of the main truths of the 12 steps that I learned is that you can't will or strong arm yourself into sobriety. 
You've already been down that road a, a hundred times, and you know where it leads. More misery. And as a recovery community will tell you, there's only one way to transformation, and it's not willfulness, but willingness. Surrender. Humility. Powerlessness. Not a pride that leads you to believe that you have it all under control if you would just spend enough on your defense budget. But step two teaches this. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. It's the power greater than us that does the work in us, not us. And here we have a king saying and doing all the same things that all the other kings in the region are doing. We have to be mighty. We have to fight our enemies. And I kind of feel for the guy because I can't say that I would have, wouldn't have leaned towards the same approach if I were in his shoes. But then there's God turning the whole thing on its head, saying through the prophet Jeremiah, the world has no time for such silliness anymore. The suffering on the earth is too great. All I want is for you to show compassion and mercy and to love those who find themselves at the end of their rope who may be so consumed with trying to survive that they don't have space to dream or to read poetry or to ponder life's biggest questions, perhaps even the refugees and the widows and the orphans, perhaps even the families fleeing gang violence and poverty, perhaps even the single moms with low-paying jobs, perhaps even the foster children needing a safe home. Yes, especially the most vulnerable. When we were at Christ House in D.C., there was a man there named Donald who was experiencing chronic homelessness and came to us th through our medical respite facility, and after about six months of care and rehab, he moved into the addiction recovery community where we live. And one day, not long after he moved in, there was a grants manager from a large family foundation. She was touring the facility and getting a sense of the work and just trying to decide whether we would be a recipient of their grant. So she walked, she and I walked into the community room where Donald was sitting, and she asked him if he would be willing to answer some questions for her. And so she asked him, do you like it here? What's the best part of being here? What makes this place so special? And Donald just closed his eyes and shook his head. I barely knew Donald yet, so I was a little apprehensive about what he was going to say. And so I think his response surprised me as much as, much as it did the grants manager. And he, but he said, I had all but given up hope about humanity, but there is so much love here. The nurses, the doctors, the cooks, the volunteers, everyone. They take so much care with what they do. They love you. And then they love you the next day. And then they love you the day after that. And then they love you some more. And then one day at a time, you realize that you've learned to love yourself again. And now I get to experience what I had been missing for a, lot, a long time in my life. Love for others, especially the most vulnerable. May not always be as grand as we sometimes imagine it. It doesn't always make the best material for the summer's hottest blockbuster movie or the New York Times bestseller list. Most of the time, it's not even good sermon material. But perhaps more often than not, it's doing the daily, ordinary things with great care. And before you know it, people like Donald have learned to love themselves again. I think we've been trained to think in love in terms of, it's not love and less blank. And we make a list of things in order to be, for it to be considered love. Let's see, reciprocity, and X amount of time spent, X amount of money spent. And then we decide if we've met all these, if we, if we haven't met all these criteria, if it's not there, if we're not going to get the A+, plus, then why bother? But to answer God's call to love others, I think maybe it's less complicated than that. Yeah, sometimes it is that. It, it is that decades-long, invested, grounded love. Sometimes it is 
that? Is it giving up your career to start that nonprofit that you've always thought about starting? Or sometimes it is loving your mother through her battle with Alzheimer's. Or it's sticking by your best friend who just can't seem to stay sober. Those are big moments that ask a lot of you, and that's the stuff that summer blockbusters are made of. But maybe more often, love is less romanticized than that. Maybe it's in the smaller, the more hidden moments in life. Maybe it's just showing up for people, like Donald. Maybe it's distracting the cranky toddler in line with his mother at the grocery store for just a moment. Maybe it's buying a sandwich for the cash-strapped stranger. Maybe it's taking a casserole to your neighbor who just lost her dad. Maybe it's finding joy in playing second fiddle to your wife in a patriarchal society. Maybe it's allowing your favorite six-year-old to paint your toenails. What is God calling you to do with your capacity to love? You don't, always, you don't always have to go for the A+. Plus. I hope you do. I hope for those big moments in life you go for the A+, plus, but you don't, don't always have to. But more specifically, how is God calling you to pay attention to the needs of the most vulnerable? However we interpret that. During Jeremiah, Jeremiah's time, the most vulnerable were the refugees and the widows and the orphans. What about here? Maybe somebody outside of your circle or your tribe. Just like the king of Judah, we may feel pressures all around us telling us to stand up, be tough, show your strength, climb the ladder, fight your enemies. But focusing our energy on those pressures usually takes us down the same road we've been a hundred times already. And we know where it leads more misery and more conflict. But if we follow the wisdom of step two, what can you allow the power greater than yourself to do in and through your life? Right where you are. Maybe you're a lawyer who can give legal advice to those experiencing homelessness. Maybe you're a real estate developer who chooses to use your expertise to bring more affordable housing to Greenville. Maybe you're just a good listener and you practice giving the gift of your presence to someone needing an ear. I wonder if Mother Teresa had been standing in Jeremiah's shoes, if she would have spoken God's word to the king like this. We can do no great things, only small things with great love. Now that sounds like good news, doesn't it? I think I could do that, at least for today. You can do that, church. Y'all can. You know what? All of y'all can do that. All y'all can do small things with great love. Amen. God does not promise to give us safety. God does not promise to give us good health. God does not promise to give us wealth. God does not promise to give us a life free of hardship. But God does promise to give power to the weak and to give strength to the powerless. God does promise to give us peace in the midst of the trials. God does promise to be with us every day. And so with glad and grateful hearts, let us lift up to Almighty God our morning tithes and offerings.
will use them for your holy purposes to grant strength and peace to your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us now come before Almighty God with our prayers. Holy God, Lord and giver of life, we give you thanks for this precious gift of life that you have given to each one of us. We rejoice in your goodness to us. And we rejoice, O oh God, that the most vulnerable matter a lot to you. We give you thanks for the, your faithfulness that sees us through tough times and your mercy that sustains us when we are overwhelmed. God, we praise you for your heart for those who struggle. We give you thanks for your repeated instructions to your people throughout the Bible to care for the widow and orphan to welcome the sojourners and aliens and refugees, to do justice for the oppressed. We confess that as a, as a society, we have often done wrong and violence to the alien, to orphans and to widows. We have benefited from structures and laws and policies that do our sinning for us on our behalf. We pray that you would look upon us mercifully and grant us the courage to challenge unjust laws, to stand up against violence, to speak out against injustice. We ask your tender mercies upon all those who struggle this day, those who are hungry or experiencing homelessness, those who are grieving the loss of a loved one, those who are sick, those who are addicted or mentally ill, those who are consumed with fear or anger. Surround us all with a palpable sense of your loving presence with us to guide us in your pathways of loving each other the way that you love us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go forth now into the world in peace. Be of good courage. 
Hold on to that which is good. Return to no one, evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit be upon you and those whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.